In order to study molecular data analysis, we first need to understand some of the principles from the disciplines it stands upon, such as ecology, molecular biology, and data science. So, let's begin by defining three key concepts in ecology, ecosystem, community, and population. And we will begin by imagining a dragon. A single dragon is called an individual, or an organism. For many biologists, including many ecologists, the individual is the fundamental biological unit. However, it's important to note that the individuals might sometimes be impractical to define, and sometimes even impossible. Are giant mycelial networks a single individual, or many? Are all grass blades interconnected by the roots across a prairie, one individual, or many? How about Pando, the forest of interconnected clonal aspen trees, one organism, or many? We also ought to recognize that the fundamental biological unit will depend on the scale. For example, for a cell biologist, the fundamental unit might really be the cell, and for a biochemist, perhaps individual molecules could be far more meaningful. This is the scale problem, and we will encounter it again and again in pretty much any dimensions we study, be it space, time, counts, genetic distance, etc. In fact, every time you encounter a definition throughout this course, I invite you to make it a common mental practice to ask yourself, why is this the chosen scale? And what will happen one order of magnitude above or one below? Now, let's go back to our individual dragon. As you might imagine, a dragon could have a family and other fellow dragons. All these dragons that are closely related are called a species. And the variation within a species is called microdiversity. And we encounter here an important definition, the species. Let's make a parenthesis here to talk about species concepts and definitions. A species concept is a theoretical idea of a species, the philosophical or biological principle to circumscribe species. There are many species concepts, such as the typological concept, grouping together organisms that share a given common phenotype, the evolutionary concept, a single evolutionary lineage maintaining its identity from other lineages, and even the nominalistic concept, which essentially denies the existence of species as natural entities. Probably the most commonly used concept, however, is the biological species concept, that tells us that a species is the group of organisms that can viably interbreed and are sexually isolated from other organisms. You probably already see the problem of this concept when dealing with prokaryotes and other asexual organisms, but we'll come back to that later in the course. On the other hand, a species definition is just a practical, tractable, operational circumscription that we can objectively apply to groups of organisms. For example, we will often use the genome of species definition in this course, which is the group of organisms that share a certain genomic similarity, such as a given average sequence identity. Now, Species are not the only groups of organisms that we can define. In fact, we can iteratively group species into genera, genera into families, families into orders, and so on, thus defining nested groups of groups of groups, like matryoshka dolls, if matryoshka dolls had many little dolls at each level. The grouping of organisms in this manner is called taxonomy, and it is, for the most part, intended to follow phylogeny. Phylogeny is the reconstruction of historical, evolutionary relationships between lineages of organisms. Let's take a very quick crash course on how to read a phylogenetic tree, because we will continue to encounter this along the course. These here are names of organisms, or groups of organisms, such as species. For simplicity, I've just named them with letters A through K. Since these are organisms that exist today, they are called contemporary, or extant groups, and are also referred to as the terminal branches of the tree. Now we start traveling back in time, to the left, and represent the lineages of ancestors of each extant group with lines, or branches. As we go farther back in time, pairs of branches start coalescing into single branches, and then coalescing again 
representing ancestral single lineages that at some point in time split into multiple lines. These groups of lineages are also called clades. Eventually, if we go far enough in time, we expect to find a single common ancestor that gave origin to all the diversity we have in A through K. That common ancestor of an entire tree is also called the root of the tree. So, what information can we actually extract from this tree? Well, as an example, we can see here that D and E are very closely related, because they share a very recent common ancestor, marked here with an arrow. If we also include C and F, we can see that they are more distantly related, and the entire group shares a more distant common ancestor. Finally, if we consider the entire group A through F, we can see that this is an ancestral group, as they share a very distant common ancestor. Importantly, all the groups I showed so far are monophyletic. When delineating collections of extant groups, for example, to define taxa, this is a very important concept we need to understand. Monophily. A group is said to be monophyletic if all the descendants of their last common ancestor are included in the group. For example, the last common ancestor of A through F is marked here with an arrow, and we can see that all of their descendants are part of the group. However, what happens if we also include H and I? Now this is the last common ancestor of the group. And you can see here, some of their descendants are missing from that group. There is a missing branch. So this group is said to be paraphyletic. Not all the important groups in biology are monophyletic. For example, we can talk about herbivores, or nitrogen fixers, or prokaryotes. And all of these are examples of important groups that are not monophyletic. However, it is important to understand when a group is and when it is not monophyletic, so we can make inferences about their evolutionary history. Let's try our hand at the concept. You see here the group F through K, which we will call violet. Is violet monophyletic? Why? And how about the group C, D and E, which we will call yellow? Is yellow monophyletic? How about crimson? Pause the video and rewind if you need and answer these questions in the comments. Ok, now let's go back to our dragons. Here we have all the individuals of the species, and now you see why I've decided to represent the boundaries with a dashed line. Well, it's important to remember that species is a conceptual definition, but these very real organisms actually do live in actual physical locations. When we talk about all the individuals of a given species that live in a given location, we are talking about a population. However, populations rarely live by themselves. Organisms of other species typically live in the same location. All these organisms from different species that live in the same location are called a community. And finally, this location is much more than just the living organisms in it. There is a landscape and a climate and physical chemical conditions and abiotic resources all of these living and non-living elements in a given location are called the ecosystem. There are other important definitions that we are skipping for now. For example, taxa and clades, groups of organisms defined by their taxonomy or phylogeny. Gills, groups of organisms in a given location that use the same resources. Or ecotypes, groups of organisms, typically from the same species, that occupy a specific niche in a specific location. But we've been talking about this location without really defining it. Could we zoom out and include a larger geographic area? Could we zoom in and be more specific? Yes, we could. And fine-tuning the definition of sites to address our specific research questions is an important part of the study of ecology. For example, a location could be an entire mountain if we're studying variation along a mountain range. But we could also define different sites along the slope of a single mountain if we are interested in studying altitude. For now, let us just loosely define four rough ranges or categories. The global scale, these are worldwide ranges. The continental scale, these are ranges that span entire continents. 
the regional scale or ranges around the country or state level defined by general natural characteristics and the local scale referring to specific sites or locations typically encompassing single geographic features such as a lake or a forest. The characterization of the distribution of organisms in space is called biogeography and the ecological study of such distributions ac across large spatial scales is called macroecology. Importantly, the macro here refers to the geographic scale, not to the size of the organisms. So you could, for example, talk about microbial macroecology. The collection of all the species in a given place is called the species pool. So we can talk about local, regional, continental or global species pools. We'll focus in the latter two scales, regional and local, because they're more relevant to the type of analysis with which we will be working. Here we are representing the entire region as a large Chartreuse pentagon, and it includes four sites that we are representing as teal pentagons. Species are represented as circles of different colors. Conceptually, if we want to think about the process that these species undergo through time, such as diversification, extinction, and migration, we can think of at least two models. We can think of the regional species pool as some sort of seed bank. Species diversify or get extinct from, from this seed bank, and they are distributed towards each specific location through processes like migration and environmental filtering. This model allows for separating processes conceptually while maintaining a simple framework, and it's called the island model. On the other hand, we can go back to the locations and explicitly model migrations between sites. This type of framework can be more realistic, but it also requires defining more parameters, and it's called the meta-community model. And finally, let's talk a little about measuring diversity a problem we will encounter often in this course. The first question we can ask when we have a collection of sites like this is how diverse is each site? The diversity in a given location is called alpha diversity. One simple way to measure it is by counting how many species are present in the site. This measure is called species richness. However, we can also ask ourselves how different are the sites from each other? The differentiation between locations is called beta diversity. As with alpha diversity, there are many ways to measure it, but a simple metric is the species overlap, or Jacquard index. Here we can see that the top right sites are more similar to each other than any other pairs, as they have an overlap of 40%. On the other hand, the bottom left side is very different from all the other sides as it has no overlap with any of them. Finally, the entire diversity in a region or collection of sites is called gamma diversity. We can think of it as the sum of alpha and beta diversities, although not all frameworks meet this equality. Importantly, we've been talking about numbers of species which relates to the presence or absence of a given species in a given site. However, we could also talk about the number of individuals in each species or their abundance. This introduces a second dimension of diversity, the evenness. Let's zoom into one of these communities. Here, over half of the individuals belong to the yellow species, whereas just one individual represents the magenta species they're not all equally abundant. In other words, there is a low evenness. There are several ways to visualize this distribution, but a very common one is the rank abundance plot. In a rank abundance plot, you sort the species from most abundant to least abundant in the horizontal axis and represent the abundances of each species in the vertical axis. Importantly, as we increase the sampling effort, we might be able to capture more species. And as we see more species, these plots tend to follow similar patterns that typically tend towards long tail distributions. In fact, this is such a universal observation in natural communities that the tendency 
towards long tail distributions is sometimes called a law of ecology, a rare distinction in the field. So, to recap, we reviewed some fundamental concepts in ecology, including the definitions of ecosystem, community, and population. We discussed the species problem and discussed the difference between species concepts and species definitions. We talked about regional and local species pools and how we can conceptualize them in frameworks like the island model and the meta-community model. We described what alpha, beta, and gamma diversities are and gave some sample metrics to measure them, and talked about long-tail distributions of species, how to represent them through rank abundance plots, and their universality in natural communities.